Hey folks, Steve here, and let's talk proof. Jocelyn Morehouse movie. Um, I quite like this poster. It's intriguing. This film stars uh, Gen Genevieve Pico, Hugh Jackman, not Hugh Jackman, sorry, Hugo Weaving, and uh, a very young and must can I say handsome Russell Crowe. Very uh, Sort of different idea of Russell Crowe to um, the Russell Crowe that we have today. Um, in this film, he's handsome, he's charming, and um, he's, uh, you know, he's an actor who's about to explode onto the international scene. Uh, but at the time of the film, he wasn't really the star that he would later become. Hugo Weaving, he was the star, as this poster would suggest, even though he looks a bit sullen in this picture postcard um, of him. And it's interesting, you, everything you kind of need to know about the movie is sort of there in this poster. Uh, you've got Hugo Weaving holding a camera. You've got dark sunglasses that he wears across the film. He's blind. Why he wears dark sunglasses, um, sometimes in inappropriate places. And the tagline of the film, sometimes it takes the darkness to see the light. True. And there you've got uh, Rusty in the background, uh, whispering sweet nothings in Genevieve Pico's ear. So Russell Crowe was meant to work with Jocelyn Morehouse again on an adaptation of a film called Eucalyptus. It was going to be her big kind of follow-up to Proof. Um, and they had a falling out on the set, and the film was never made, which is a shame. The film was also going to star one of our favourites, Nicole Kidman. But Rusty, uh, I don't know, he wasn't happy with the script. And it didn't happen. Um, it's very disappointing. Because... Uh, I think Jocelyn Morehouse is a very, very interesting, very, very talented director. She's done some really, really, um, really good work over um, various films in various roles. She was involved with a film called Muriel's Wedding, which you may have heard. It was directed by her husband, PJ Hoven. But um, The Dressmaker is the one that she's probably now most famous for box office bonanza but uh it's sort of jocelyn morehouse's australian films says a lot about uh australian comedy that we want i really want to sort of talk through today which is this whole idea that although australian comedies do quite well domestically at the box office internationally they actually they rarely do very well and uh, then that sort of asks the question, you know, if a film is actually being made for international audiences and, you know, an Australian uh, film-going audience are never going to be able to bring back um, any profit to a film because there's not, there's not enough of, of us here, um, you know, where's the investment in the investment for making Australian comedies? Should, should, should that be a genre that we're investing in if the films are notoriously not going to do that well overseas. I mean, of course, there's always exceptions. But um, by and large, Australian comedies do well in Australia, but not so well overseas. And The Dressmaker is a really interesting example because The Dressmaker absolutely killed it at the local box office. Made, um, I think, over 15 million last time I looked at that stat. It's true. I read an article last year for uh, you know The Conversation. And um, I, you know, I wrote down the box office figure of the dressmaker, which I think at the time was like fourteen million or something. But apparently, it'd been updated, and the uh, the producer wrote to me within minutes of the link going live to tell me that um, I was a million dollars off the actual box office budget. So there you go. Clearly, box office means a lot to the filmmakers, ladies and gentlemen. Um, now, when the film was released, it was um, parental guidance advised, as you can see by this poster, 
but it's uh, later been upgraded to M. Um, there is some frontal nudity, and there's some good, honest Aussie um, cursing. And, uh, well, it's an Australian film, so maybe uh, that's, you know, another reason why they gave it an M. This is the UK poster. Uh, look, I must say, I'm not really that impressed by this poster. I mean, okay, you kind of get the idea that uh, Hugo Weaving is blind, but you've got uh, Rusty. Now, my eye is tricking me, ladies and gentlemen, or does Rusty have a... A cigarette going in the ashtray there at the edge of the table, and he also he clearly seems to be smoking um, a cigarette while he's looking at photos, head down, both of the heads are down. It's um look, it's not very appealing, is it? You know, it doesn't really tell us much about the film whatsoever. That's all I'm saying. Maybe that's why the film didn't do that well overseas. It was critically uh quote. Um, well received overseas, but uh, box office didn't really do that well. Okay, now uh, we're going to talk about genre and the whole problem of genre and the problem of proof and why there actually isn't a lot of writing on a film like Proof. And the reason for this, the reason why there isn't actually a lot of writing on Proof it's because historically Australian genre has been put into two clear camps, right? So in the 70s and in the 80s, there were two kinds of films being made in Australia. There were the funding body films, right? Like the Screen Australian films, which Screen Australia didn't exist then. Forget that, right? They were funding bodies. And they would sort of fund more the, the, the kind of the arty films, the, the non-genre films, right? And then there was the thing called the TMBA genre films where you could basically get these tax write-offs if you put all this money into local films. So they were getting all these funding from overseas people and they are just making all these really bad uh, genre movies. You know, right? And that was con considered Australian genre. And the more intelligent films were never considered genre, even though, of course, all of those more intelligent films like Pitting Hang Rock are clearly working within particular genres. But... That kind of division also continues in scholarship on Australian movies, where you've got people who write on the serious, intelligent films, and you've got other people who write on the more uh, genre, you know, cheesy films. And the thing about Proof that's really interesting is Proof is a genre film. It's a comedy. But it's also a high-class comedy. You know, it's not a, it's not an ochre comedy. It's not a crass comedy. It's an intelligent, smart, edgy comedy. And, and that's what I really like about it. And something I, I must say I really do like about Jocelyn Morehouse is the way that she's always subverting her genres and playing around with genres. If you've seen The Dressmaker, that, that's, a, that's a hell of a ride. That is a hell of a ride, that film. Because you're, you're watching it. And you're like, okay, we're in like a road movie and now we're in a Western and now we're in a comedy and now we're in a melodrama and now we're in a... Oh, it's just crazy. It's just the way that she changes up the uh, the genres is just quite um, quite a head spin. And it's something I do like about her as a filmmaker. I think she does you know, really interesting stuff. But anyway, my point is we need more love for the genre film more respect for the genre film and more um, more consideration that a genre can actually be smart. It doesn't have to be this ochre kind of ugly thing going on. And a good case in point is this film, this book, The Oxford Companion to Australian Film. Well, that sounds, uh, that sounds highbrow, doesn't it? Hey, look who's on the cover. Nicole Kidman. Now, can I just say, when I put that book, um, into this slide, I didn't even realise that that was Nicole Kidman front and centre. I saw Mel Gibson um, to the left, well, to the our right of the of the of the image. But there she is, 
Nicole Kidman, front of centre. And like I keep saying, if you want to understand contemporary Australian film, just follow the filmography of Nicole Kidman. Anyway, the reason I'm showing you that book is not so I can get my, um, my Nicole reference in, which I've done that. That's pretty good. I got that in early this week. I'm showing you this book because this whole book is about the history of Australian film, the Oxford companion to Australian film, and nothing about genre, nothing, not a reference. Pathetic. Really, really bad, bad. When you think of how important genre is to Australia, then you have a book like that which doesn't even cover it. Insane. But we're going to rectify that, ladies and gentlemen, because we are going to bring some credibility and respect to genre in ways that it hasn't been given respect until this point. People will look back at this lecture and they will look back at what we're doing in the classroom and they will say, game changer. Okay, so uh, proof. Now, proof is a fart part of... Did I say fart? I th I'm, I'm meant to say part. It's, 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 see, it's all that crass comedy thing that's swirling around in my head right now. National Film and Sound Archive is part of this uh, restoration program where they restore on um, films, you know, like films, certainly films shot on, like film film, deteriorate. And at some point they need to be digitized and restored and things like that, right? Okay, so they've done a whole bunch of films. They did Shame with uh, Deborah Lee Finesse starring in it. She's this uh, uh, motorcycle riding barrister who uh, she comes to the aid, the girl in trouble, and uh, she's good. That, um, that actually premiered at uh, MIF 2017 where Deborah Lee Finesse was uh, in the house with her husband, Hugh Jackman. Maybe that's why I mentioned, uh, you know, I earlier referred to Hugo Weaving as Hugh Jackman. Hugh Jackman was there as well, supporting his wife. And why not? She she does enough supporting of his career. Anyway, so they've restored that. Flirting. You know, he stars in Flirting. That's right. I don't need to name her name. She's in there with um, uh, Noah Taylor. And Noah Taylor is also in the year my voice broke. Just restore Noah Taylor movies, it seems. Uh, Son of Matthew. Now, that's that's a worthy one, which I'll get to in a, in, in a sec. And you've got some other ones. Bliss. Um, oh, and of course, Howling 3, The Marsupials, 1987. Because we need that film restored, don't we? I know. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, if only, if only there was a, a good restoration. I want a good Blu-ray copy of The Howling 3. To really understand the marsupials. Anyway, Philip Moira, he directed Howling 3, the marsupials. Philip Moira, famous for um, Mad Dog Morgan with Dennis Hopper. And of course, Proof was uh, restored. Now, this is the thing. Like, you've got National Film and Sound, Ar Sound Archive, and they're restoring all these films, right? And that's good that they're restoring the films. But my issue with Australian cinema is we have such a, a small selection of films that we can actually access. Then why would you take films that are already readily and widely available on DVD and at you know various streaming places, why would you take those films and do restorations of them when there's so many other films, right, like Evil Angels, which are pretty much impossible to buy in Australia. That's my point. Now, you may disagree, and I, I will get to that at the, sort of the end. Well, you know, I'll ask a specific question about the restoration and what we should be restoring. Should it just be films that we love and say, these are our great films and let's just really concentrate on those? Or should it be making um, a wider selection of films available? That's all I'm saying. Now, Sons of Matthew... Right, that's a harder film to access. So you know, I'm I'm wholeheartedly for that. Okay, now um, we're back in the early '90s with Proof, and uh, early '90s, good moment for comedies in Australia. Strictly ballroom, right? 
Baz Luhrmann's, uh, you know, arguably Baz's best work. I know that's a controversial comment, but if you actually, there's just a charm and a joy to Strictly Ballroom where everything after it became so phonetic and self aware and forced, I would say. But there is just something really, um, really honest and really authentic about what he's actually doing strictly ballroom. Uh, Muriel's Wedding, uh, Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. You see, all these films, they're all being made in the early 90s, along with Proof. Right? And as uh, Lyndon Barber says in the, one of the readings for this week, uh, Proof is really the film that, um, that, that ignited this, this launch. And uh, what you've got in these films, I mean, they're, they're interesting films because they're all uniquely Australian in style. They've got this camp, brightly coloured and in-your-face kind of style. And there's something very um, authentic about them, authentic Australian. And the question I'm asking here is, what do you think of when you think of authentic Australia? Are these the kinds of films that you're thinking of? And how does a film like Proof work within your idea of what is authentic Australian? Um, of course, not everything in the film was authentic Australian, like Rusty Crow, New Zealander. I just thought I should uh, mention that to you. Now, um, comedy. It's Aussie comedy. The thing about uh, this film is, I mean, if you're coming to this film just expecting to laugh your ass off, um, you may be somewhat disappointed. It is funny. There is a quirky humour, a quirky Aussie kind of humour going on here. But it, it's not so much set up like the American humour. Um, Australian comedies traditionally they're not so interested in the gross out or set up punchline punchline humour as is um, the American comedy. There, of course, are Australian comedies which do that, but by and large, the most in, in, um, endeared of our films and the the more normal of our films are the more quirky ones, right? So they they're more based on characters, and they really are character studies. And all of the films in this course, you could say, are all character studies. Our genre films are not plot-focused um, like a lot of countries. Our genre films are still very much character-focused. And when you think about the Australian... What the Australian film does really well is they launch careers for the actors, and that's because the Australian film, what they do really well is they give good performances um, and they give actors the space to give really good performances and a film like Proof is no different and the genre films is no different um, to what Australia does a lot. Um, now Australian comedies, so like I said, they do well locally, they don't do so well internationally. Now if there was ever a case for Australian um, Australia to make more comedies, this is it. Now, this is the thing. Australians like to think that they're above looking at box office and evaluating the success on box office. But we're not. We're not above that. We're below that. Believe me, we're below that. And if you want to make a successful film that gets a good box office, right, make a comedy. You know why? Look at the reasons why people go to the cinema. So they did a survey, and this is what the people said, right? The number one reason why people go to the cinema is socialising. So you want a social film. You want a film, you can go with a couple of friends and you're going to have a good time, good laugh. The second reason, they tagged along, right? Saw the trailer, interested in the adaptation. Ah, adaptation, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, relaxation. Um, girls or boys night out. Okay. Uh, fan, that's another one. Routine, that's good. Who's um, who's who's got the like film going as a routine? You know, like every Thursday night, that's my routine. I go to the movies. Well, I mean, you know, I probably do have a routine, but you know, I'm not a normal film goer, am I? 
I would, um, you know, invest more of my time to watching movies to keep my finger on the pulse of the, uh, you know, the international cinema and the local cinema so I can, um, you know, bring great knowledge to the classroom. Uh, evening of entertainment, that's another one. Uh, not to miss out and the hype around the film. I mean, the point I'm trying to make here is that a comedy, it's kind of ticking all those boxes. And if you think of The Dressmaker, Jocelyn Morehouse's other film she made, you know, that was a film that was really about hype. It was really about, um, look, I, you know, I suppose you could say it's a girls' night out film. But, you know, I saw it and um, I know a number of people who saw it who didn't, like, roam the cinema, um, you know, in a pack of um, females. You know what I'm saying? Like, so I think that uh, that whole distinction of, a film as a girls' night out kind of film or a boys' night out film is very, very uh, murky and I don't really think it kind of works. Anyway, um, you know, that being said, I quite enjoyed the craziness of The Dressmaker. Um, okay, let's move on. Proof. Now, uh, Lyndon Barber, he loved it. Oh, boy, does he love proof. Whew. Um, should I read the whole quote? I'll just read a bit of a quote. There has been nothing quite like it before and no other local film has since managed to mine quite such a striking mixture of accessible humour and intellect. Yeah, I was saying that before, wasn't I? The whole thing about, um, you know, genre also being intelligent and proof being a bit highbrow. Uh, I'll go back to the quote. Proof remains one of a kind. It's eccentric or quirky, over-the-top gestures or ABBA songs and an art film with belly laughs. So you will laugh. Lyndon, he reckons you're going to have belly laughs. So that's good, isn't it? Not like a good belly laugh when you're watching a film. Um, uh, I'll, put, I'll throw in an ellipsis here. He's talking about the Khan screening where, I quote, it received a standing ovation and heaps of acclaim from the movie world's top opinion makers before selling to territories around the globe. Okay, so, um, yeah, the film did very, very well, and there is something kind of very unique about the film, and I want to really unpack that uniqueness and really what's going on. And the, the thing about a film, it's always like, okay, so how do we do that again? And the problems of denationalization, as we've been discussing uh, over a number of weeks now, is what's happening with denationalization is that the government want less and less involvement in the industry, certainly from a financial point of view. So there is stronger encouragement for co-productions. They've basically allowed for international production companies to buy um, local production companies. And things are very different when proof is getting made. And um, thanks to an agreement between Film Victoria and the Australian Film Commission, which became the Screen Australia, to support talented first-time filmmakers, it became possible to raise the entire 1.1 million budget, which budget for proof, from federal and state government sources alone, with 800,000 coming from the ASC, Australian Film Commission, and the rest from Film Victoria. Now, why that's significant is unlike most features, there was no prerequisite that part of the budget be raised from outside sources, right? So what would later happen is um, to get the funding from Film Victoria, you had to get a budget from outside sources, and this was usually done with pre-sales to foreign sales agents and things like that. And what happens is the more people putting money into a film, the more opinions they have, like hey, we'll give you, you know, a million bucks for this, but we want dot, 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 you know, you know, less Australian humour, more generic humour, you know, that sort of stuff. So if, if you think that Proof is a, a wonderful film, but just how naturally Australian it is, maybe, um, it, it could have to do with that, that they weren't actually thinking about, you know, financially getting money from overseas. 
Um, and the fact is that international funders are less interested in funding comedies or uniquely Australian stories. Um, there is a graph which um, uh, I couldn't find, but it's there somewhere on my computer, um, which says, you know, the sorts of films that international funders like to fund. And comedies are actually very, very low on the list for the for that reason that they usually don't, don't travel that well outside of Australia. Um, question that I ask is, would uh, a film like Proof have survived a test audience survey? You know, like we know that uh, someone like Philip Noyce, director of Dead Calm and Rabbit Proof Fence, big fan, big fan of the test audience screen survey. Loves it. Um, and, um, you know, we can talk about this at the, uh, uh, you know, at the screening, but um, questions like, do you understand what the movie is about? Um, were you drawn in by the story? You know, this sort of standard questions. If you could change something about the film, what would it be? What do you remember about this film? Um, you know, would you recommend it to a friend? Do you like the ending? I think unlike, say, a Philip Noyce film, which is very much a popular audience kind of filmmaking idea, this is a very, very smaller, quirkier thing. You're like you either you're either with proof or you're not with proof. That's the thing. So it it's it, it becomes more risque, I guess. Or more daring, maybe not risque, um, but daring, I think. Yeah. To make a film like this, which is why it's really good that we have films like Proof. As proof that we do other films than just try hard American uh, pieces. Okay. Love in the Australian cinema, that's another thing that we need to um, clarify. Strangeness of her character. This is We're talking about Pico's character is intriguing and blackly amusing rather than alienating, right? She's just very quirky, uh, characteristic of the local cinema, a character's unable to get together, and that may be something you've been noticing across this course. There's not uh, so much romance. You know, you wouldn't say these films are romantic films. They're not really for the, uh, you know, young lovers. They're really about um, people trying to get together or love actually not really factoring in too much. People are either together, and that's that, or they're not that interested in getting together. Uh, Jeff Mayer, who's written a lot on Australian cinema, is also written on Proof. Uh, Oz comedies often expose the dark and somewhat neglected side of the prevailing but ever-changing representation of Australia. Now, what he's begging on about there is you've got this thing about the landscape, right? And the landscape is always changing and everything about Australia is always changing and people are kind of just constantly trying to keep up with what's going on, right? And the whole idea of love is like so superfluous to actually what's going on because there's more serious, deeper and darker things going on in the Australian cinema than uh, lonely people just trying to get together and get it on, uh, which I think is worth worth thinking about. Often, if you think of Australian films when there is actually a romance, it's often buggered up by someone. So, um, you know, this is the the most uh, romantic um, of the the films in the course, even though it's not romantic at all. So that's something else to think about the Australian cinema: the whole idea of romance and love. And is that, that again, if that's something that um, distinguishes us and the cinema and whether you like that. Um, I'm just going to finish by uh, saying a couple of things about women because Jocelyn Morehouse is a woman and it is worth just throwing out some facts to you about the the real problems of... Um, well, it's not really the problem of females in the industry. It's actually probably the problem of males in the industry because there's too many of them. And um, Screen Australia are doing everything they can think of to get more females involved in the industry. Um, and they've set up a whole uh, like gender matters um, thing where they're actually giving funding to female-led productions. 
the uh, the controversy of that has been um, that the money being distributed to uh, to female filmmakers are uh, female filmmakers who who are already in the industry and they're already actually successfully getting money and getting their films up. And wasn't the point of gender matters to actually get more females into the industry? And the the question remains whether gender matters is actually doing that. But we can save that conversation for another time. I just want to throw facts at you, right? And um, I'll leave it there. So from 1970 to 2014, right? Producers 70% male, 30% female. Directors 84% male. 16% female writers, 79% male, 21% female. And you can see on the other side, uh, it's got documentaries from uh, 1988 to 2014, and females are more represented, um, but still uh, not enough. Uh, far more female producers. Um, the, the directors is up quite significantly, like the 20% um, up. From uh, from the feature films, but it's still pretty pretty appalling when you look at that, and then you start to think of the films that we're making and whether that's actually a a positive way of thinking about the industry. Like thinking, well, okay, if there's only say sixteen percent of female directors, what sorts of films are we making, and um, is that a way of evaluating? what's happening on screen does more females in the industry change what's happening on screen and the answer of course is both yes and no um and it's 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 this thing of if you just get females involved across a wider range of jobs not just directors that things would change um talk i was talking to a a casting agent uh the other day and um, she was saying to me that when a lot of the the producers come to her, um, they like certainly white male producers, they will assume that kind of the nondescript characters from a screenplay are also white and male. And she says that what she tries to do is she tries to sneak in. Um, you know, it's a bit sad to think of that's the term she was using, sneak in. But you know, females and non-white characters into roles where it would just be assumed that that role would be taken up by males. Um, there is a weird thing going on in the industry. Do you know that the extras, right, extras on a film set, so if you're like, you know, in a, you know, in a, in a, a march or something, majority of the extras are males. Do you know that? Weird. Well, maybe not weird. But anyway, that's an interesting um, stat that we can talk more about. Uh, did you know, speaking of um, uh, just flick, flipping back to um, genre and, um, you know, what's going on, the top 10, 2014 of, uh, 2012, sorry, of films, if you look on the right-hand side, a lot of these are, um, uh, I don't think any are directed by females, but uh, there's quite a few comedies, which proves how much Australia love their comedies. Um, what would I recommend for the list? Oh, I don't know, not much. Mary and Max, that's a love story of sorts. Charlie and Boots, wouldn't recommend. Brand New Day, would recommend. Oh, whoa, why did you say that? Well, that was like a weird um, transition from one slide to another. All right, back with the women after that uh, little uh, sidetrack. Um, okay. This, this, um, this uh, graph on the right-hand side really, like, says it all, doesn't it? In 2011, women tended to be on a lower income than men in the film industry production. Um, which, uh, you know, says it all, really, that, um, you know, women are getting paid a lot less. 
then uh, men. And then uh, film and video production. So I'm looking at the, uh, the left-hand side and the bottom one. Um, film and video production and post-production. Number employed, all right? So you've got uh, 9,908 people employed in film and TV. Women, 35%. And um, which isn't actually up from 1971. 1971, it's 36%. It's down. It's going on there. Australian cinema box office 2012. 25 Australian films were released in cinemas. 16 were directed by women. Yeah. But um, it, I mean, it's a global problem. I mean, this is the thing about international Australian cinema. We do have to not just vacuum the local and say it's a local issue, like it's a local issue, but it's actually an international issue. And if you look at the top 250 films from any country, 12% were directed by women. 12%. Um, so there you go. In the last three years, Screen Australia funded titles were slightly more likely to have women in key creative roles than. The total Australian slate. All right. So um, it's all pretty uh, pretty dire, isn't it? Um, but uh, I, I think that these conversations and these graphs and these these data that we have available now, if it's doing nothing else, it's making us more aware of the problems of what's going on. Um, with gender inequality in the industry and that maybe we'll be more mindful and more aware of that when making films. And like I've been saying over this course, if this, if this industry that we call the Australian cinema is anything, it's actually about giving filmmakers skills and it's really important that we give all different sorts of people skills, males and females and, you know, not just, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a divert, a great diversity of people. Um, is what I'm, is what I'm saying here. Um, to think about. So I hope the things uh, may change in the future. Um, now, Ava Du Vernay, I think it's how you pronounce Du Vernay. I think it's that. Now she says Netflix is the answer because she says the problem is in America is um. You've got, well, I'll just read the quote. There's no point talking to the quote. Because, oh, no, this is the quote. I find it terribly exciting, especially for someone like me, a person of color and a woman, to be able to see different ways to enter into space where I'm able to touch large audiences and not have to go through the same five studios and three networks and hope that they recognize what I'm doing and value it. That's the way it was. We weren't seeing enough inclusion. Now there are more options. Inclusion is a necessity for survival. She's talking about Netflix, of course. And she's like, Netflix, bring it on. Where do I sign? She did a documentary for them. It's called The 13th. You know, 13th Amendment, freedom of speech and all of that. It's all about race, problems of race in America. And it's fantastic. It's on Netflix. So if you've got Netflix, queue it up. Really interesting stuff. Um, Tough viewing, but um, important viewing for the, the time that we're in at the moment. Anyway, she's saying that the problem, is, the problem isn't actually production. It's actually ex um, exhibition and distribution that you can't actually see your films made because the people who are controlling how, where films are played and what films are played are blokes who aren't actually thinking about diversity. So she's saying something like Netflix where they just have to actually fill up a lot of space is fantastic for all people of all different diversities because Netflix are actually saying you can get a niche audience on Netflix in, in ways that you can't at the theatrical exhibition. So that's something to think about. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's a really interesting, positive way to think about Netflix. Okay, final thoughts. How do you define Australian comedies? When you think of Australian comedies, how do you define it? Uh, do you watch Australian comedies? Would you pay to see an Australian comedy? Have you paid to see an Australian comedy that you can remember? Maybe it's on Netflix. Is Proof a comedy? It is a comedy, but is it a comedy? So, Because uh, I know some people are going to say to me, Steve, it's not a comedy. You promised me a comedy. You didn't deliver. 
Well, it is a comedy. How does the film operate within this course? Think of the other films, think of the themes, think of the whole idea of, you know, the launching of particular careers. Uh, Hugo Weaving, who would go on to be in not one, but three Matrix movies and do other things internationally. Um, and Rusty Crow, who just, you know, went from strength to strength. Uh, it's, 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 we, we look at Rusty a bit differently now, but in the, uh, in the late 90s and the, the you know, or all the 90s and just the very early 2000s, he was great, you know. LA Confidential, fantastic. The Insider, he put on weight for that film. See, again, another reason why you should put on weight if you want to be taken seriously in the acting business, right? Look great in a movie, then the next movie, stack on a pile of weight, obviously people like you more. And uh, he was nominated for Academy the insider. He didn't get the Academy and he stormed out when they read out the uh, the name of the winner. I forget who the winner was. But, uh, you know, typical Rusty Crow behavior. Anyway, um, but, you know, in the 90s, when the film was made, it was great and he looked great, you know. He, lo he looked like a figure of health. Um, okay. What sort of films should be restored? Impossible to access films or our most loved movies or both. You know, that's, again, something to think about uh, when we're talking about um, the Australian cinema and restorations of what's going on. Okay, a lot to unpack there. Um, hope you enjoy Proof. I think Proof is great. And I'm with Linda Barber. I think it's a really, really excellent, excellent film. I think you'll like it a lot. It's, uh, it's charming. It's nice. It's funny. It's fun. And... Uh, a young Rusty Crow and a great, a great Hugo Weaving. And Genevieve Pico should also get, an, you know, not, not just an honourable mention because she is so fantastic and she's kind of like the spine of the movie when you think about what she's doing. She's actually got the harder role and she delivers in spades. This film cleaned up at the um, AFI Awards and it did get an honourable mention at the Cannes Film Festival. Australian Comedy, honourable mention at Cannes Film Festival. Take that. All right. Uh, leave it there. Look forward, as always, to talking through this one with you. See you soon. Bye for now.